Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Road to the Summit webinar series. My name is Jennifer Burgoyne, and I'm a program manager at Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. Thank you so much for joining us today as Dr. Janine Washington presents this workshop on building youth resilience through school-based mentoring. Before we get started, I wanted to go over just some housekeeping information. You can probably tell all phone lines are muted. We found that on larger convenings like this, there's often some unintended feedback from participants' lines. So we've muted the phones to prevent that. Um, but that being said, we absolutely still want this to be a participatory experience. So if you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please feel free to type them into your question box on your control panel and we'll answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. In about a week, you'll receive an email containing information on how to access the slides and the recording from today's presentation. So be on the lookout for that in about a week. Today's webinar is part of the Road to the Summit series, which gives us a sneak peek at the National Mentoring Summit's programming and workshops. The National Mentoring Summit is the only national forum that brings together practitioners, researchers, corporate partners, government leaders, national organizations, and many, many more people to advance the field of youth mentoring. And we're expecting this year's summit to bring together 1,000 individuals in the movement. The summit will take place in early February, February 1st through the 3rd, at the Renaissance Washington, D.C. downtown. This year, we're offering 85 workshops that explore the theme, Building Relationships, Advancing the Movement. Workshop sh sessions showcase research, innovations, exemplary program models, and collaborations that have positive implications for strengthening the mentoring field. If you'd like to browse the summit's workshop offerings or learn more about the event, I encourage you to visit our registration website for more information. Um, and I can send you a link to this registration website in just a moment in the, in the chat box. So today's webinar and the rest of the series is a free learning opportunity that will offer you a sneak peek at Summit Workshops through three webinars leading up to the Summit. The webinar topics align with the Summit's plenary topics, which are the intersection of mentoring and education, which we'll be focusing on today, and then the intersection of mentoring and community policing or community relations, which we'll be focusing on later in this series. Today's webinar aligns with the summit's first plenary on how relationships can advance educational equity and opportunity for our nation's young people. We know that positive mentoring relationships can have an impact on students' academic success, Yet too few young people have the support of adults in their lives that they need who can really support them academically. Mentors have been shown to improve a mentee's school attendance, boost their academic performance, and increase their chances of completing high school. So these relationships between caring adults and students really need to remain a critical component to educational reform nationally. Our first summit plenary will explore interventions and approaches that have been implemented to increase the quality and intensity of mentoring relationships in school settings. So we think this webinar today will explore a really great example of an effective school-based mentoring program. And to learn more about future webinars in this series, you can visit Mentor's website. Before I introduce you to today's speaker, I wanted to do two short polls uh, just so we can get a sense of who's on the line today. So bear with me as I launch this first one. Okay. So what is your experience level in the mentoring field? Are you a beginner, intermediate, expert? 
I'll give you a second here to answer. All righty. So it looks like for about 50% of you are intermediate, 42% are beginner, and 10% are expert. That's great. We think we have some information to, for each of you today. And our second poll here, what is your role in the mentoring field? Are you a practitioner, researcher, funder? Are you part of a school? Or if you're something different, feel free to write that in your question box. All right, so it looks like we've got a lot of other. Um, so I'm curious to see what those are. I'm going to read through them in a moment. We've got a lot of practitioners, um, good a good amount of school staff, some researchers, and a few funders. So thank you all for taking the time to, to join us today. And I think that uh, Deneen's presentation will really have information that can help all of you in your work. OK. So with that, I am thrilled to introduce you all to today's presenter, Dr. Deneen Washington, who served as a principal in Newark Public Schools for 13 years now. Dr. Washington was born and raised in Newark, New Jersey, and attended Newark Public Schools. Deneen became employed as a family service worker for Essex County Division of Welfare in 1993 and a second grade teacher within Newark Public Schools in 1998. After teaching for two years, she entered the graduate program at St. Peter's College for Education Leadership, where she completed her master's degree with honors in one year. In July 2004, Deneen was appointed as the principal of Maple Avenue School. Over the past 13 years, Deneen has worked hard to improve the academic achievement of all students, increase parent involvement, collaborate with community partners, and empower her staff members to improve their professional growth. In May 2015, Deneen received her doctorate in educational leadership from Keene University. Her dissertation topic was the impact of a school-based mentoring program on middle-level students' academic achievement and behavior. Deneen is now beginning a new journey with a high level of enthusiasm. She will begin the first stage of two books this fall. One book will focus on the memoirs of the students she mentored for six years, and her second book will focus on the African-American journey through the grief process. So with that, I'm thrilled to pass things over to our highly qualified presenter, Dr. Deneen Washington. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon. I want to thank you, as Jennifer did, for joining us this afternoon as I present to you my findings and also information in reference to a school-based mentoring program. The school-based mentoring program that I founded was called the Twin Sisters Mentoring Program. And this program was established in 2007. This was a group mentoring design and it was designed to provide cultural and social experiences for female students within the school that I was a principal. The original students that were in the mentoring program was originally in grade two. And I began to work with them because of their eagerness and desire to learn and to extend their experiences outside of the classroom. And the students within this mentoring program were from different racial backgrounds, different cultures, and they had different learning abilities. But the key indicator that helped me to work with them was their willingness to learn. And the theme for this program was entitled self-empowerment. I wanted to work to empower them to do better and to move beyond their community. This was a six-year program. And one of the things that I did to, to bring it home to them and to, for them to help realize their, their academic potential 
and their, their level of confidence as a woman in, in, the, in this world was to read this affirmation every time we met in a group setting. And this affirmation was something that Nelson Mandela spoke about, some other artists and authors, and it was also featured in a, a movie that a lot of students in their age group liked, which was Akira and the Bee. And it was about affirming them as individuals and letting them know that they are more powerful than they know. So I wanted to empower them through these things and other things throughout their experience. The program structure was really intense, and everything was purposeful from the beginning of the program to the end. And one of the major factors that I wanted to do with this group is to close the achievement gaps in mathematics with these students, because many of these students did not like mathematics, and that's because they didn't have positive relationships with their teachers. So that was one of the major goals that I wanted to um, ensure that we, we achieved. Also to, to partner with private organizations, public organizations, and nonprofits to bring other resources to our schools. And we would use these young ladies as spokespersons and that liaison between the uh, school and these organizations. And the ultimate goal was to improve the self-esteem and self-efficacy of these young women. This was an intense program, and I had the opportunity to structure activities where they met every day. So we broke up into semesters, and each semester was focused on different themes. However, with parental permission, we were able to meet with these young ladies every day. Now, I didn't do all of the different activities with them. I delegated a lot of responsibilities to staff members who also served as mentors. But the time on task that these young ladies had really made them better students. Two days a week they had math tutoring. That goes along with our goal of decreasing the achievement gap in mathematics. Also, to get them moving, to, to look at the nutrition and obesity rate with, with the, uh, young girls, we wanted to keep them moving and to get them exposed to dance classes and also cheerleading classes. The cheerleading classes took two different avenues because one, they got a chance to, to do team building with their peers and structured activities, and they also became school spirit spokesmen for their school. So they had opportunities to perform and to foster school spirit around the room. They also had the opportunity to meet with me once a, once a week in our rap sessions, which, which were very instrumental in their growth. And their activities exceeded beyond our structured activities and beyond the classroom, beyond our school. And they were involved in so many different activities. We did community drives where we, we collected socks and canned goods and gloves, coats, toys. Um, we also did community service at nursing homes, at daycare centers. And because of school funding, they were responsible for raising their own money to, to facilitate their own activities. So each young lady had their own fundraising goal and their parents, school members, and community members helped them to reach their financial goals. We had, because they did well with their fundraising, we were able to take them on a wide variety of, of field trips, from cultural to academic, extension to just social events. And then the young ladies also had an opportunity to host several school-sponsored activities. One really good event that they hosted was a health fair where they collaborated with Northwest Visual Hospital, with another school, with culinary arts, and they were able to facilitate a rapid activity where students were able to rotate to different health stations and learn about how nutrition and how physical fitness impacted their health. And then once those young ladies uh, were able to get into that seventh grade successfully, they had to begin to pay it forward and to give back. And they, had, they became buddies to an um, a, a aspiring second grade program with new students who wanted to be mentored. So the fact that they were being mentored, it inspired other students to want to be in a, in a similar program, but then they also, I required them to give back. So we did 
quarterly activities with these young ladies and they spent time with them in their classrooms and they hosted arts and crafts activities to increase that bonding between the two age groups. It was quite successful. And we, I mentored these young ladies for six years. And mentoring matters. Their, their lives were different. Their academic classes were different because they had different lenses and they had different mentors that were able to assist them with coping, especially in the middle school. And this picture is a picture of one of my mentees who had the opportunity to give a speech and introduce our first lady, Michelle Obama, who was a visitor at Maple Avenue School, where I was principal. And she introduced the first lady with a level of confidence. And that level of confidence earned her a hug from our very first lady at Maple Avenue School. So that picture, she still has on her wall at home. Every time I talk to her dad, her dad still talks about that one moment in her life that she'll never forget. So I was happy that I was able to create that experience for her. That's and I had amazing. there were fifteen young there were fifteen young ladies in this program and they all had different voices. So one of the major things that um, that I wanted to focus on was to give them all their voice. And the next slide talks about some of the different things that they had to say about the mentoring program. This is these are their quotes. My teachers tease me and said I talk too much. Yes, my teachers tease me. But between sisters, I became a leader. So because she was a leader in our group, that leadership, those leadership abilities facilitated in her classroom as well. The boys teased me for my size, but in between sisters, they loved me for me. And just self-love was one something that came out of that self-empowerment thing that we had. I always had to babysit my siblings, but once I got into between sisters, the little kids, meaning her siblings, had to stay home and I had a chance to be with my friends. That was a major component of parents buying into our program, parents understanding that these young ladies needed a separate time for themselves in order to develop, develop their whole self, their spiritual growth, their social emotional growth, and an academic growth. And I was very pleased that these parents over time entrusted their children to me and, and believed in the program and what it was worth. That's great. And Deneen, we're getting a couple comments here um, that the, the volume is a little low. Would you mind, it's OK, no worries. Would you mind uh, picking up the phone and speaking into it? OK. Thanks so much. OK, I hope this is better. <laughs> that's better, yes, that's great. OK. OK, the next slide. Now, as a researcher, we know that quantitative data is one of the great resources that, um, that we can use to solidify and to validate the things that we do. Now, and this, those quotes that I recently read were from some things that the young ladies said throughout the program. I think what was more significant was that I met with these young ladies two years after they left Maple Avenue School in eighth grade and went on to high school. I met with them once a year as a kind of debriefing. But on, in their second year, when they were high school sophomores, I conducted a, an evaluation. And I included the name here, Participant Evaluation of, of Instructor and Program Quality Survey. So within this survey, it had over 60 items. And it evaluated the various structures of the program, the mentor, and the relevance of the program in their lives. So this was done two years later, and the results were, were just overwhelming to me to think that two years after they had already left from under my care, that they're still thinking about the experiences they had within the program. So I'll just go quickly through the slides, and then you can reference them again later. The first slide talks about the organizational structure of the program. And as you can see from the from the bar graph there, the yellow, there was this is a five point scale, ranging from one to five. The five was the strongly agrees and the yellow was the agrees, but there were no scores below three. So those weren't I didn't even include those numbers there. So as you can see that they believe that the program was structured. 
everyone received the program manual. The manual is updated every year, and you can see by their remarks and by their by their feedback that they felt as though that was relevant for them, and that the topics that were organized for them were very relevant to them. Let me go to the next slide, and it, it talks about the program's effect on their post personal development. And this, this is a way of analyzing whether they thought that the program had effect on them. Whether it, one question was, I learned about myself, the program was challenging, and the program increased my knowledge and understanding of others. And I'm really glad to see that that area was a strongly agreed area for most of the students. One thing that we want to make sure that we do is that when we're doing different activities that the students value what we do for all the time that we spend. And sometimes they don't value it in the beginning and they, it comes later on in life. But with this particular program, the students really did value the time that others spent with them and the, 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 the value of the program on their personal life and on their academic life. Um, one of the questions was they were satisfied and had a sense of achievement. And that was 100% of the girls said that. And that's because there were so many opportunities for them to showcase their skills and talents in various avenues within the school and the community. The, the second slide talks about me as a mentor. And it talks about my capacity in dealing with them. And you know, this is, you have to be very reflect, reflective when you think about how someone views your capacity. So one of the major, uh, most important questions in that co component was for me was the mentor was fair. Because when you're implementing discipline and other changes within the organization or within the program, you want everyone to make sure, understand that your decisions are fair. So the majority of them felt as though I was fair. And another question that meant a lot to me was that my mentor had an effective teaching style. Because a lot of students felt as though they weren't performing well in school because their teachers didn't meet them where they were. So I was very happy to, it was really good to see that two years after this program was already finished for them, they felt as though the teaching that they received through the program was effective for them. So that was something that was really um, good to hear from them. The level of participation that they had within the program, and most of them strongly agreed that they put forth a lot of effort and that, um, that the program, that they worked well to, together with one another. And I will admit that during this time, I was on them and I saw these young ladies at least twice a day. The frequency of my contact with them was very important in their development. And I think it really had a, it had a, a, a strong impact on their development. And I have one question that, um, that I was not surprised with, but I was glad that they answered it truthfully when they said that group discussions were productive. You know, because very often with, when you're having rap sessions, things don't always go your way, but you have to have that, that discussion protocol and get them to open up and get them to understand that it's not always about them, that sometimes you have to make compromises and you have to collaborate with your peers in order to have a, a goal and to be consistent. So that, it was just, I was just happy to be a part of that development with them. And as, as Jennifer said it before, this program, meant so much to me that I decided to use the basis of this program to, to conduct my dissertation from King University. And so I had this question, why this program, why these girls, and why, why now? And what does this data say? So from my statistical data that I collected, and I had seven different variables. And the one variable that meant a lot was self-esteem. And I have the results here. And the, the, this result was significant for the, for the variable of self-esteem. And the result of, of my research indicated that students, female students who were mentored had a higher level of self-esteem than students who were not mentored. And this, this really was the, was the peak of understanding and having others to understand why I do what I do consistently with young girls in the inner city. Now, not just my data, but another, a lot of other data that is out there about young girls and why they need to be mentored and why now is the important time to do that. So I was able to collect data from a wide variety of data sources. And I have five data sources listed um, on the screen that you can go back and reference as well. But briefly, I was able to grasp 
that data so that you can take a look at it. In the first slide, it talks about the amount of students, female students, that are enrolled in high poverty schools. And as you can see, from 2008 to 2013, the amount of African American female students who are enrolled in high poverty schools is significantly higher than total amount of students nationwide and also white students enrolled in schools nationwide. So this, is, this creates a sense of urgency around providing extraordinary experiences for African American students, female students in high poverty areas. The next slide talks about the rate of maltreatment of student, female students between the ages of 18, 8 and 14 between 2008 and 2013. And this data is gathered from the amount of students who are in foster care, the amount of students who are in non-traditional families other than mother and father, and the number of students who are currently in families that are being um, investigated by family services. And as you can see, African-American female students are in a disproportionate rate in those type of families than even Hispanic and total students together. So this, it, this adds to the urgency that the time to mentor female African-American students is now, because that, over the time from 2008 to 2013, there has not been a significant decline. If we look at a, a unique one for birth rates, there has been a decline between 2008 and 2013 birth rates among all female students and especially African American students, female students. But still, there's a sense of urgency. We still have too many students between the ages of 8 and 15 who are having children. One of the major slides is the amount of female students who are experiencing emotional and behavior difficulties. And this, this connects to the social emotional training that many schools are beginning to implement within their schools. There is still a disproportionate amount of African American students who are having emotional and behavior difficulties in school. Somehow we are not meeting their needs within our school system. So we need to take drastic measures to ensure that our students' needs are being met, to ensure the academic and the social emotional success. And I know the last slide talks about the suspension rate. And this was taken from just 2013 alone. The rate of female African American students being suspended from schools is more than 50% higher than any other racial group. This is the urgency now. Our children, our female African-American students need interventions and they need it now. So that's why I need to advocate and I need all of you that are listening and watching to advocate for more additional, for additional female-based mentoring programs. And that was the compassion part of the, <laughs> of the this presentation. Now, who mentored you? Now, a lot of us have been mentored, and you may have not been in a structured mentoring program, but there are very, a lot of natural mentoring pairs that are out there, and sometimes you don't even realize that you were mentored until you look back. But I just wanted to highlight on the next slide a few of famous mentoring pairs, people that we know about, Barbara Walters and Oprah Winfrey. Connie Chung and Kang P. Young, Christian Dior and Vasi St. Blanc. So this goes to show us that even if you are, are a privileged American and you come from different socioeconomic status, you still need a mentor to help navigate yourself through, through your career goals. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about mentoring programs and why some programs succeed while others don't. This presentation was to talk to you about resilience, why some students do well and some others don't. And I gave some definitions there of resilience and school-based mentoring. And we 
students that are in inner city schools, some, some of them have a resilience that no one else can understand because they have obstacles that are in their way that they didn't put there, but they're forced to be to have to go through those obstacles. So sometimes those students come off stronger. So they need adults to help navigate themselves through those obstacles to ensure that they can they can successfully transition into college and careers. So school-based mentoring can provide those avenues and those extra resources for students to do that. So let's talk a minute about what builds resilience. When someone has a high level of resilience, they feel as though they're in control, they are flexible, they feel connected, and that could be connection to their family, to their community, to their jobs, to their schools. When you are resilient, you are proactive, you take the necessary actions to, to, to put things in place so that other things don't happen, and that's usually because you've been through so much or you've had so many obstacles in your past. People who are resilient are socially competent, they're able to solve problems, and they usually are able to create a personal vision for their lives and for the lives of others in their communities. So today I want to talk to you about some of the components that make up an effective mentoring program. In order to have an effective mentoring program, you must have frameworks in place that describe the physical personal and environmental characteristics that make up the whole child, not just the academic portion, not just the social person, person. You have to have all those components, have that holistic approach in order to have a successful program. You need to be able to develop systems that measure. measure. Measurement is the important critical piece of mentoring, and it's also tied into funding. So that's a very important piece that if you're not using a measurement tool for your, your program, you really do need to develop that. And there are a lot of different um, tools out there that you can use to effectively assess the needs of your students before they get into a mentoring program. And once they're in the program, to measure the effectiveness of your program. And once they exit the program, to determine the, the, um, the, how successful the program was. All three components can help you ensure funding, and it can also help you with the recruitment of new students into your program. Now, one of the major things that you want your program to do is that you want it to facilitate connectedness. One major thing that students um, thread, especially in middle school, is that no one understands them. That is, is that no one likes them, that everyone hates them. And very often, students feel disconnected from their schools, from their families, from their community. So mentoring programs kind of have to have multiple roles. As you can see, the mentee, and then you have the mentor in the middle. The mentor has to be able to reach all of those various components. And it can be done. It can be done with the proper resources, with the proper research-based strategies. A mentor can really help facilitate all the connectedness that students need to excel in school. And programs can help promote connectedness by ensuring that every student is connected to another adult. To ensure that families that have children being mentored are getting those other support systems to remove those barriers that I talked about before that can impede their child's success in school. That the, that the mentoring program helps to serve as a liaison so that the communication gap that very often exists between school and home is, is taken away. And that it can also help teachers to communicate with families and to communicate with students. That's a very large barrier that is very difficult to break down because very often parents feel like the school is not open for them. So mentoring programs can really help break down those barriers. And again, I need to emphasize supporting the whole child, that holistic approach. So who do we mentor and why? At-risk at students is, is where we can start. And we can start looking at at-risk. There's several factors that, that identify what makes a student at-risk. But um, those, one, those students who have academic deficiencies, those ones that are just not making, making the cut on standardized and school-based tests, those students who are having frequent behavior problems, 
those students who have these high risk factors that may be in danger of dropping out of high school, those students have, that have been retained, and those students who are less likely to graduate because of basic skills. Those are maybe students who may be may need credit recovery. Those are students who may be in alternative programs. Those students need it more than ever. And in order to, to in order to create that connectedness, one thing that we really need is communication. There are various components for building strong and caring relationships, but communication is the most critical element. We must be good role models. We must learn how to collaborate with the community, with organizations. We must have that exchange of knowledge and with that respect and trust come into part and do all of these things. We can empower people and we, must, we, we need to start that with having um, realistic goals. But unless we communicate with the parents, with the students themselves, with the people with that are within these school-based um, mentoring programs, people that are outside of the mentoring program who, or who occupy the same space, we need to communicate because everyone needs to buy into these programs in order for them to be successful. So when you want to identify the students who will benefit from mentoring, some things that I was able to do is to, to identify the students that need to help need help with their socialization skills. So that might be your bully, believe it or not. They can benefit from mentoring. It might be the student that just relocated and this is a new school for them and they don't know which table to sit at lunchtime. And lunchtime is a really good a really good place to go and observe students to see which students will benefit from mentoring. Students that that need to develop an empathy for their peers. I had some hardcore students in my program, and they just didn't seem to interact well with their peers, and they had that disconnect. But by being with their peers, they were in, in doing structured activities and purposeful activities and letting them do things that are authentic, they can develop a, a level of empathy that they need in order to, to navigate through high school and on to, and on to college. Um, and then you have any students that have faced trauma, and it's to those students that want to make change, that they, they believe that everyone can succeed and everyone can co-occupy this area, those are the students that have that willingness you need to bring them in. And students that want to do it because their friends are doing it, sometimes they, you wonder whether what's their motive. But if you have that intent and you have that willingness, those are students that you can, you can pull into a mentoring program as well. And the key to this, this program was that it was a school-based program, which means that we operated within a school. So it was embedded within the school culture. And this was one of 10 mentoring programs that existed at this particular time. So the school culture was open to it. There was a constant willingness of staff members to want to expand and develop their own mentoring program. So when you have a, a, organi when you have a culture that has embraced the, the need that students need to have extra experience in order to succeed, you, you'll find teachers that want, it, that want to expand their experience in working with children in a different way. And most important, the stakeholders, and those are your parents, the teachers, the students themselves in the community. The mentor has to be in the middle. They have to be the one that's able to navigate and communicate between all these individuals because without one piece, the program won't be successful. And to look at some research, there are six common barrier themes, six themes that, um, that create barriers between school and home. And the first is between the school and the home, home and school. It could be not receiving the information that was put in the backpack or not calling the school when their child is sick. The parent-teacher barrier, the teacher not communicating with the parent when there is academic deficiencies or when there's behavior issues. The student barrier with the student not wanting to go to school for various reasons or the student not wanting to make that connection with their teacher 
or the barriers that exist within the school system. And that can be a, way, a wide range of things in the inner city, um, parents feeling as though um, no one cares or they're in the wrong school, the school doesn't meet their needs. But then you have one of the most important barriers that as a mentoring program that you can help to, to break down is the student-teacher barrier. Because that's the relationship that is critical for the student's success. So we need to remove those obstacles and get the student and the teacher to respect one another and to and to communicate more effectively. And a, and a mentor can do that. And the important part about having a school-based mentoring program is that you get your staff involved. As I said, in, in my school, we had 10 mentoring programs. One of them I facilitated, that means that that means that there were nine other programs that other staff members were facilitating. And they took my lead, so I modeled what was expected. So they became mentors. They were able to bring in additional resources to the school. And it just allowed people to, to share their leadership and to bring others on board. And it becomes a trickling effect once you do it and once you get used to doing it and once your staff realizes that you have an um, invested interest in the children in your school. Now there are various designs of mentoring, but to me, in, in the situation that I was in at my school, the group mentoring um, was really beneficial. And it allowed students who maybe who may shy away from that one-on-one -on -one contact to feel more comfortable with a group setting, with traveling in, in, in a cohort. Because once they enter the a mentoring program, unless they change schools, we kept them into the, into the mentoring program until they graduated from our eighth grade program. And it helped to build relationships. And these students are still in relationships now. And it, got, it allowed so many opportunities for cared adults, adults who cared, to, um, to facilitate various components of the program. Because if you couldn't be a mentor, then maybe you could be a tutor. Maybe you can help um, chaperone a trip. So it was multiple opportunities for different people to, to be a part of the program. So the purpose of this program was to, of this project was for me to, to emphasize that group mentoring is effective. It works. And I just wanted to emphasize that I started working with a group of students when they were in second grade. And our school was a K-8 to K to school. So they stayed in the program for six years. No one was allowed to exit the program, unless, like I said, like I said previously, unless you grad, grad, move to another school. So we had a chance to see all the different challenges and changes that came through their life. It was brought right into our program, and we dealt with it. So it can be successful. It will be successful if you have a level of resilience within yourself and you believe in the children and you understand the levels of urgency that exist within our inner city female African American population. These students who I started working with in grade two are now seniors in high school and I have re-entered their lives and I'm now working with them with their high transition from high school to college. And I can't emphasize how rewarding this, this experience now with them is because now they are really their own advocates and that they're independent thinkers. And it's just a wonderful feeling to see that success rate. And I'm, I'm positive that many of them will get into the college of their choice and they, they'll move on and be productive citizens. And that's what it's all about. And it's showing that they paved the way for others. So I want to thank you. And just remember that mentoring matters, whether short term or long term, you have the ability to have um, a positive impact on today's youth. Thank you so much, Janine. Uh, as a school principal, a mentoring program practitioner, and a researcher, you're really such an important voice in this conversation about how mentoring can support young people through academics. So thank you so much. We have been getting some questions, so I'd love to pose a few of those to you, if, if that's all right with okay. you. Um, yes. So the first one here, let me see. Um, 
So someone asked, how are girls recruited into your program? Did you do recruitment or were they referred um, through school counselors or teachers? And what, if any, um, qualifications or requirements were needed from them? In the beginning, I recruited a group of six young ladies. And I recruited them because of their level of enthusiasm about learning. And they were, they were, they had read a story in their class, and they decided that they wanted to take that story and, and transform it into a reader's theater's workshop for their peers. This is in second grade, so something about them just, just sparked my interest, and I, I started meeting with them and having lunch with them, and then I just, they said, well, why can't we meet with you all the time? So it was from that and initial. Um, interaction with them that I decided to make it more formal. And from that six, it grew to 15. So that six, I recruited initially. But then from there, I um, dealt with referrals, also with parent recommendations. Um, and then as we moved on and as um, additional programs began to develop in the school, we were able to, um, to allow students to go into the program that would be their best fit. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that was great. And it's obviously a group mentoring model. Were there a limit of the number of girls who participated in the program so you could keep a certain ratio? Or did you accept any uh, young people who wanted to join? We accepted any young people that wanted to, to join. We did have um, different um, designs based upon the grade levels. We even though I started the program in second grade and I worked with them up until eighth grade, many of the programs that were developed after that focused on middle school. And then we had some programs that focused on grades three to five. And then we did have preliminary programs that started in, um, in grade two. But the, um, the level of intensity um, really occurred in the middle school. But there was no requirement. There was no waiting list. If any student um, wanted to be a part of the program, they were they were um, pretty much sent into a program that best fit their needs. And it didn't really matter what program they went into. They just wanted to belong to something. And we wanted to make sure that we had the right fit and that we had the program that was going to offer the appropriate services for them. Mm -hmm. OK. And what are some tangible ways a mentor can, can bridge the barrier between students and teachers? I think that's a great question in this environment. One thing that, one practice that I had in my school is that we had rap sessions where we may pull a great level of girls or a great level of boys and just give them the forum to speak. And sometimes if you have student council, you have specific leaders within a grade level, and just write, have them um, produce their concerns to the teachers and talk to the teachers about listening. And you have to, but this culture can't be just dictated. It has to be nurtured over time. So you have to ha have teachers that are willing to listen to children and willing to break down those barriers of the role they play in these rap sessions and listen to what the kids are saying. Um, and it came from practice. I had to model it myself. I had to show teachers that, yes, I can listen to students. I can still enforce the rules, but then I can make some, some, I can make some provisions for them as needed. And when it had to deal with, um, with their social and emotional learning, we had to deal with those issues because unless we dealt with the social emotional piece, the academic piece wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be relevant to them. So I think modeling it first to the teachers, providing the systems to support teachers was important as well. And then just general, um, generally or gradually re reducing that responsibility to the teachers. So in the beginning, I may have been facilitating those sessions and then being in the, the liaison back to the teachers and then gradually folding teachers into that process. That's great. Um, and how did you help your teachers understand the importance of mentoring? Um, it, you mentioned that you did have buy-in from them and they were supportive. How did you kind of convey the importance of mentoring um, and, and just to get them to understand that academics are probably the most important, but groups and mentoring to discuss issues outside of 
education are also very important. I guess by showing them the statistics, letting them see the data, then and schools have a wealth of data. You can access attendance. You can see the students that are late, the students that will be late because they don't want to attend math class. You can look at GPA, the students who are just not cutting it and they're not succeeding. Maybe students, they, they do well in academic, but they don't do well in their activity classes. They hate gym. And you know, there's research that why young girls hate gym. So we need to, we need to be able to, on a school level, provide um, different variables to that. Um, why some students who don't who, who don't value art, they're, they're failing those classes. So we need to be able to show them the data, to show them um, the data, some of the data that I showed that some of, how many the percentage of our students who are in foster care, the percentage of our students who are who are coming from broken homes or who are homeless. When trying to when we I think what was effective for me was to having them um, look at be empathetic about the barriers that children face. Because sometimes they don't know. They don't know that that student who leaves early 10 minutes late, 10 minutes every day, is because they need to catch a, a group bus because they're going back to a homeless shelter. So without just giving out specific information, you could just still give the data that, that you know, that, that kind of brings it to a head for them, that it gives them that red light. And, you know, they realize that a one person, a positive person in their life can change that. And if um, the suspension data and the behavior data is important too. The students who who will receive mentoring, they had less incidents of of behavior problems because they had that one adult that checked in with them every day, and they felt as though anything that that was bothering them, they can talk to that adult with rather than act out in class or get involved with something that's against the rules with another student. That's great. Yeah. And how did you bridge the gap between the school and parents who, whose students were absent a lot or not very engaged um, in their students' lives? Were you able to really mend that communication between the school and the parents through the mentoring program at all? These are for the students who were mentored? Yeah, the students who were being mentored and their parents. Okay. Did the program have communication with the parents um, of students who were less engaged? The students, all students in our school, that district has a database where we are able to collect data for the students that are tardy and the students who are absent. So as a principal, I'm able to see that data daily and I can kind of say, okay, if this student, if Tangela is is in his mentoring program and she's been absent four days and I can touch base with the mentor and have the mentor contact the parent. Because the, the, parent, the students that were in these mentoring programs, and we had almost 200 students that were involved in mentoring in our school, they made that personal connection with that mentor, with the lead mentor of that program. So if I wasn't the lead mentor of that program, I'm not, I might not be the best person to make that initial contact so they may see me as another barrier. So by me having empowering other teachers to be leaders in these programs, it, it just gave parents another voice and they didn't feel as though that the principal or the court system was calling them to talk to them about their child's attendance. Sometimes that was effective for us, having a teacher call. And very often students that were mentored, they didn't miss as much time in school because every day was something to look forward to because of the structured activities after school. They wanted to be in school. They wanted to be in school on time. And when you have other tangible incentives built in, it kind of it, it reduces the, the level of incidents with tardiness and attendance. But we found that students that were mentored, those parents tend to call us personally when they knew their children were going to um, be out. Or to let us know in advance that my child's going to be out, can, can make sure that we make up our homework, and can, if any mentoring activities that she missed, you know, can, can you provide us with information to it? So it was breaking out those barriers by just talking to parents and not always chastising the child in front of the parent, just talking to the parent about what barriers do you have, how can we help you to overcome them. And then that time, time is helped because parents need to see that we were invested in their children, that we truly cared. That's great. And you talked a, a little bit about this, Janine, but 
Can you talk a little more about what you feel are the advantages and disadvantages to having a group mentoring uh, model? A lot of programs out there are one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so do you feel like there were any challenges with that sort of setting, and how did you overcome them? The challenges in the beginning was um, having them understand one, an one another and respect one another. And that's why we need to launch, we launched quite a few team building activities where the students were able to get to know themselves and get to know one another. So once they got to know themselves and once they got to know each other, they were able to advocate for one another and they kind of protected one another and then they were that type of shoulder to lean on when uh, whenever someone was facing um, some type of issue within our home or within school. And very often they would go to another another member of the program before even going to the mentor to discuss the problems that they may have had, you know, may have had. And with the with the group mentoring, it allows the students to to um, transition in cohorts. So, like I said, the students that I had, I had them from second grade to eighth grade. So every year we had the same children. Yeah, we can we were able to. Um, to bring other t children on, but those same students stayed together throughout the length of the mentoring program. And I think that that, that length of time together really had a positive impact on them. It also made the students feel more comfortable when we had rap sessions as well, because it helped them to open up one and, um, open up and not thinking that it was just that one person will be having all of their personal information. They felt more comfortable talking in front of their peers. Mm -hmm. And we're getting some questions about how you develop the curriculum for the small group meetings, um, both for those meetings and how did you choose dance and cheerleading as the physical activities for your mentees? Okay, for the curriculum, like I said, we focused on various themes. So it may be a theme based upon a book study that we were doing because we would read together, we would have focus on books. Uh, it may deal with an urgency issue within the community. It may deal with an issue within the school building. Any issue that we wanted our students to have more information about to increase their knowledge base, to increase their level of empathy for their peers, um, that helped to facilitate our group sessions. And sometimes we would have to put that to the side and deal with the issues that they needed to get through to make help them get through the week. So we can have, sometimes we had program so structured that then something else would come up and we would have to handle that. We would have to talk about sexual harassment, about bullying, those types of things. But we tried to have um, quarterly themes um, that can tie into um, books that we were reading, that can tie into self-empowerment topics, um, things of that nature. And with the second part to that question, I'm trying to remember. Oh, sure. Yeah, it was, about. yeah. The how you chose uh, dance and cheerleading as the physical activity. Oh, dance and cheerleading. Um, at our school, we had just eliminated the basketball team, so school spirit was at a low. So one of the ways that we wanted to revamp school spirit is to have the cheerleaders, to have them perform, because we had monthly assemblies. So our cheerleaders were able to go and perform at monthly um, at monthly uh, assemblies, but in dance because we had a dance program in our school, and because we also had a partnership with Alvin Ailey Dance Company and with the New Jersey um, Performing Arts Center. So from that, we were able to get artists in residence at our school. So that's kind of how dance came into it. Cheerleading came about because of the, the needs of the students. They wanted to have some type of group because we had eliminated the sport aspect of, um, of, our, of our building. And different groups had different focuses. Like um, the group that I work with, we had a focus of cheerleading. We had an all-male group. Their focus was martial arts. We had another group, and they had a different focus. They did yoga, and one group did Zumba. So every group had a different focus. And the students help to, to select those focus areas as well. Oh, great. So yeah, and we're also getting a couple questions about the age of youth. 
Um, how did you decide upon the, the initial cohort, what age they would be? Um, and do you think the program would be as successful if it started either younger or older? Or do you think that's the right age group? Um, like I said before, the, 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 the spark that started was second grade because these, um, a certain group of students just had this, this eagerness to want to learn more and they needed, they needed an adult to help them maneuver do stuff to get to be seen and to do more activities within the school. As the time went on, I just saw saw a lot of levels of urgency that we had within our building, within our with our students, and the the need, the major need was in middle school and getting those those interventions to our students so that they can be successful in that adolescent time period. But we also felt that there was a need to engage our first and second graders in preliminary activities, but not so structured. And then in our three to fifth grade level, we needed to have more mentoring programs, but again, not as structured as the middle school. So versus in the first and second grade, it might be like a monthly meeting, once a month, um, different activities based upon monthly themes. In third to fifth grade, it was more of a, a project-based activities with mentoring. It was still in group design. And then in, the, in our middle school, we moved towards um, really structured programs that really had a lot of career and college readiness um, skills built in within a program. Okay, great. And I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, we got a question. You mentioned um, issues that came up like bullying or sexual assault. Were the girls referred to mental health counselors or was there any kind of partnership between you and guidance counselors when sensitive issues came up? Yes. And at the beginning of every year, um, we allowed our social worker to come in and to have a private session with the girls so that she can talk to them about about confidentiality and about their bodies and about their rights as students. And she was always available, guidance counselor as well, and that included every group. So any issues that came up to deal with infringement of their rights, those issues were dealt with individually to make sure that they got their needs addressed and then as a group to, to, to um, increase their knowledge of certain things. And then we also had different partnerships with other organizations that help provide other services as well. And we were able to do referrals to other organizations that can work with families. That's great. And all of these things and were accumulated over time. So it took time to develop this data bank of resources and to understand what children needed in that particular age group, or any age group, really. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we got a question here about funding. Did your school district provide additional funding for the mentoring program, or how was it funded? Well, the I was able to fund teachers, other than that, I wasn't funded, but teachers that served as mentors, they were able to get compensation, a stipend, as a, as a club advisor. In terms of the activities, funding for the activities for the students, it was done through fundraisers. And like I said, like we had partnerships where we didn't have to pay, where they provided the service, like Alvin Ailey Dance Company, Martial Arts Company, other companies that came in to do services for our children, we didn't have to pay for those. So those were partnerships that we developed over time. But in terms, we did t-shirts, we took them on trips, all those things were funded through the, fun, the, the fundraisers that the mentors and mentees collaborated in. Oh, that's a great idea. And I think we have time for one last question here. Um, we got a couple questions about evaluations and assessments. Do you have any specific um, assessment tools that you're using for your mentoring program? And with those evaluation results you received, was there anything you did with that information to continuously improve your program? Yes, well, you do informal evaluations as you go, 
Um, and that could be um, you're monitoring the attendance, you're monitoring the grades of the students while they're in your program, you're monitoring the disciplinary referrals and suspensions of students while they're in your program, you're monitoring um, parental involvement while they're in your program. It was towards the end of this program, I would say into the fifth year, that I really began to utilize formal evaluation tech um, tools. And one I used um, with my dissertation research, and another one that was included in this in this presentation. And even though the one that was included in this presentation was done two years after these young ladies graduated from the program, it could be used at any po any point in the program. It could be done done in the beginning, in the middle, and various mid um, checkpoints is up to the individuals who are running the program. And we have various tools that can be found online and, and, and researchers that can be written and you can get permission to use the data. And you would, I just would emphasize that you need to get parental permission before um, implementing the evaluation. Yeah, that's great. And I would just add, uh, the National Mentoring Resource Center just released its measurement guidance toolkit for mentoring programs. Um, and oh, yeah. I really recommend that as, as a resource. And, uh, a resource. I'll uh, copy and paste the link to that resource in the chat box. Oh, so, if, yeah, if any of you folks are looking for um, a kind of measurement guidance, then please uh, see that link that I just posted. So with that, I, we got so many great questions, and I thank everyone for submitting them. And we got through a good bunch of them, but um, a lot of people were also asking, yeah, about. Um, finding the presentation slides and resources, and I will be posting those on the mentors mentors website within the next week. So once those are up on the website, you'll all receive an email um, directing you to those resources. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Washington, for joining us. You're you have thank such you, a great sir. perspective, and uh, it was just a, a great privilege to have you on. So thank with that, you, I wanted to. Yeah, with that, I just want to wrap us up today. Um, thank you all so much for attending today's webinar, and, and thank you to Deneen for presenting. It was great information. Um, as I said, the information on how to access the slides and recording will be emailed to you one week from today. To learn more about the summit or to register, please visit our registration website, um, and a link to that will be in, in the email you receive as well. And finally, I encourage you to register for our next Road to the Summit webinar, which is called Mentoring in the Face of Community Violence. That will be on December 7th. And this webinar will explore how mentoring programs can support mentors and mentees in the wake of violence. So thank you all again so much for joining. Um, I hope you have a, a great rest of your day and your week. And hopefully we will see you next month on this series. Take care. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.